In ancient Rome, the highest honor that could be bestowed on someone was to be given a triumph. A triumph was a ritual parade celebrating a major conquest in battle. It was celebrating a battle in which there had been capturing of slaves and the killing of at least 5,000 enemies. Think Game of Thrones. The slaves would be marched before the triumphant general while the people lined the street with garlands and a crown was placed over the general's head. Jesus and his disciples had probably witnessed many military parades like these in Jerusalem. In fact, many scholars believe that on the same day, that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, a very different procession took place on the other side of town. Coming from the west, Pontius Pilate, governor of Judea, entered Jerusalem at the head of a column of imperial cavalry and soldiers. Pilate was arriving from his pleasant seaside capital of Caesarea to lock down the city of Jerusalem and prevent trouble during the Jewish festival of Passover, which it might be remembered celebrated the exodus of slaves from another empire. Could it be Jesus was intentionally mocking Pilate's procession by having a parade of his ragtag followers riding a humble donkey and in fact in Matthew a nursing donkey with a colt instead of a war horse entering from the opposite side of town. Many think that is exactly what Jesus was doing. That this was a nonviolent demonstration that was part of a much larger nonviolent revolution that Jesus was in the midst of leading. A nonviolent revolution. But while Jesus knew that military victory was not his plan and was not in his future, some among the crowds did not. Some in the crowds and even it appears within the intimate group of his disciples had not grasped the shocking reality that Jesus would not be destined for any honor of any kind, but only for the worst kind of shameful death. If a triumph was the biggest honor one could receive in the Roman Empire, the most shame-inducing thing that could happen was for you to throw, for, for, you, for them to throw a parade for you where you have to carry your own cross to the place where you would be crucified and literally shamed to death. Crucifixion, as most probably know by now, was reserved for the very worst criminals, as well as traitors and political prisoners, those who were considered so heinous that their execution must be public and prolonged to send a political message. State terrorism at its highest form. No wonder the gospel of Jesus Christ was such a hard sell in the beginning for both Jews and Gentiles. What other religion is built around a God who dies? It's important to note here that Jesus may not have been intending to die. Is it possible, some think, that he still held out hope that his nonviolent revolution might succeed, that the kingdom of God, the beloved community he, he proclaimed, might be born on earth as it is in heaven, which was, of course, the prayer he taught his disciples. What we do know is that Jesus allowed himself to be executed by the state rather than turn to violence himself. Jesus' means were always completely consistent with the ends that he sought. John Dominic Crossan, a well-known Jesus scholar, begs us never to forget that Jesus was 
publicly executed. That Easter represents the resurrection of the executed one. I know that some of you, many of us as progressive Christians, have become uncomfortable with the way that the cross has been used in Christian theology. As a symbol, it's been horribly abused. It's been used to justify suffering, passivity in the face of violence, or even domestic abuse. And it's nearly erased the message of Jesus' life and ministry. We must always resist these uses of the cross. We must reclaim the radical message of Jesus' nonviolent revolutionary life, his feedings, his healings, his radical inclusion of all kinds of people, especially the most marginalized. But as we enter Holy Week, our Palm Sunday and Passion readings are an invitation to wonder. Again, why God chose in Jesus to be revealed not in a Roman triumph, but in the humiliating defeat at Golgotha. As we begin our pilgrimage into Holy Week, we might reflect with the eminent black theologian James Cone that the real scandal of the gospel is this. Humanity's salvation is revealed in the cross of the condemned criminal, Jesus. And humanity's salvation is available only through our solidarity with the crucified people in our midst. Faith that emerged out of the scandal of the cross is not a faith of intellectuals or elites of any sort. This is the faith of abused and scandalized people. It was this faith that gave blacks what Paul Tillich called the courage to be. And so, as New Testament scholar Matt Skinner has written, when we put crosses on our altars and on our churches, we are remembering a particular kind of death, which is God's way of saying, that even the most pointless, the most terrific, the most pathetic kind of death is where you're going to find God. For that reason, it matters how we treat people, even the most so-called invisible or expendable people. And so may God give us this holy week the eyes of faith to look at the cross and see Jesus's and thus God's solidarity with our pain and the pain of humiliated and crucified people everywhere. <clears throat> May we have the mind that was in Christ Jesus, who dared to lead a nonviolent revolution out of his commitment to the God who seeks to build the beloved community right here, even here, on this earth, as it is in heaven. Amen.